Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jong Pyo Han. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Information Systems and Analytics here at NUS School of Computing. And uh, it's my great pleasure to um, <clears throat> present some work I've been working on uh, recently. Uh, the title is Opacity and Un Unintended Con Outcomes in, in Blockchains um, Algorithmic Governance Through the Proof of Stake Consensus Mechanism. So uh, this is joint work with uh, some, some colleagues of mine at IT University of Copenhagen, uh, namely Jonas Barbjorn Andersen, Christoph Müller Block, and uh, Jason Spasovsky. Um, so, um, so we're here to talk about blockchains and proof of stake consensus mechanisms and, and all this. But, but before we talk about blockchains, um, I want to I want to talk more uh, in general first to kind of set the stage for a broader kind of class of problems that we're dealing with today um, in, in this day and age. So, you know, the, the, as you know, uh, with uh, a lot of new technologies such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, all these new, you know, uh, exciting developments that we see in, in computing today, uh, what we see in, in industry is really the rise um, and popularity of algorithm driven systems. So these are systems that are driven by like artificial intelligence, machine learning type of algorithms, and they're you know, they're pervasive and, and everywhere. So, you know, just take casual examples, you know, restaurants in Singapore, you know, you probably use TripAdvisor or HungryGoWare, all these kinds of rating sites. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is that um, depending on whether you rank in the top 10 um, in these search results or in these um, rating results, uh, this can actually, your rating can actually make or break your business. A, a, um, a, a restaurant may actually go out of business or become extremely, immensely popular uh, uh, due to um, its rankings within you know, popular sites like TripAdvisor. Um, so, you know, the, there are these material consequences due to algorithms. And again, these rankings are determined by people's ratings, uh, recommendations, engines, uh, algorithms, so on and so forth. Uh, another recent example um, where Amazon uh, adopted just to, to streamline and, and make more efficient their uh, recruitment, their hiring practices, uh, they implemented, uh, they, they tried to implement an uh, AI-based recruiting engine. Uh, and uh, what they found out was that this, this um, AI system was biasing against women candidates. And so, you know, after, you know, substantial investments in this technology to, to streamline their processes, uh, Amazon actually uh, decided to scrape the whole um, system and, and so that they can reduce this bias. So things like you know, algorithmic fairness, um, uh, what is it, the uh, explainable AI, all these things are, are important you know, today in, in, in the area of computing uh, because we don't want these kinds of algorithms to unintendedly produce uh, outcomes that are unfair. For instance, okay. Uh, another, you know, so so algorithms are everywhere. You know, it determines you know, the the recommendation systems determine what you buy online, what music you listen to, uh, what kind of content you like, and and kind of propagate through your your social networks, what movies you watch. Everything is driven by these algorithms. Now, um, so what I want to say here is that um, algorithms have these real world consequences that are actually materialized in practice. The thing about algorithms is that uh, we, a lot of time, oftentimes we see that algorithms lead to some unintended consequences, such as you know, bias against women in, in hiring practices. Now this is due to this opaque connection between the data, process, and outcomes. So when we think about developing systems like enterprise systems or not that are used in, in, in companies it used to be fairly simple right so when you can translate um, the the functional requirements into technical requirements and you could predict based on if you have this kind of data you have this processing of that data and you have this uh, predictable outcome that results but with algorithms um, what, what becomes a little challenging is that uh, we don't really know what the results will be based on kind of the, the data that we have to train these algorithms. So uh, if, uh, if the, the, the data that we use to train or the data regime changes, then the algorithm may, may produce um, results that we have not anticipated. Uh, and that could have some biases, inherent biases, because of the data uh, and the you know, 
we don't, it's a black box, okay? So the fundamental question that, that we're trying to tackle, the broader class of problems, that we're trying to tackle in, in kind of my long-term kind of research stream is you know, how do we design more predictable algorithm-driven systems? So to, to <clears throat> be able to design information technologies and systems that, are, that produce uh, intended outcomes. So here the keyword is predictable. Now, it's very hard with algorithm-driven systems, okay? Uh, predictable and explainable. What this means is that we, we want to incorporate uh, the designer's intention, intended outcomes should be kind of internalized into the, the, um, the design of the system and um, so that we, we, we will produce the intended outcomes. Okay, now, so let, let's go back to, to blockchains. Um, and, and see how, how this kind of works um, in the blockchain context. So, and, you know, uh, obviously uh, all of you are, are uh, more, probably more um, aware and, and knowledgeable about blockchains than I am. But just to, to give a, um, a quick definition, uh, blockchains are distributed, is a, basically a distributed ledger technology in the form of a distributed transactional database secured by cryptography and governed by a consensus mechanism. Okay, so, um, so what this means is, you know, uh, if you look at a simple use case, um, you know, someone requests a transaction, uh, the transaction gets broadcast uh, to a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, consisting of nodes. Uh, one of these nodes becomes uh, the, is chosen as the validation node or the validator node. Uh, and um, once the transaction, whatever it may be, it could be a, you know, a cryptocurrency transaction, it could be other, any kind of digital token, record, any kind of information, once that's verified, the transaction is combined um, with, with other transactions into a block. That block gets appended to the blockchain. And once it's on the blockchain, then it cannot be changed. Okay, so what, what, that, um, what that means is the key, the biggest value proposition for blockchain is this tamper resistance. So once it's on the chain, then you know, it's forever on the chain and you cannot change it, you cannot tamper, you cannot delete it. You cannot edit it, or you cannot um, you cannot um, change any information that's already on the chain. So what we're saying, uh, what what you know, this technology does is that it creates a trustworthy system where we can trust the validity of the information that is stored on this distributed transactional database. Okay, so we have this. Uh, we 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 put our trust into um, the the information that's on the blockchain. And we take it for granted that that is the truth, that is the ground truth. Okay, now <clears throat> uh, if we go back here, the key part of this blockchain kind of um, scenario is this validation process. Uh, the beauty of it is that we do not need or we don't have to rely on a central operator. Because if you have one central operator, um, you know, the operator can be tainted, can be biased, can, could have some ulterior motives. And actually, if the central operator is the validator, uh, then we cannot really trust that that central operator will always uh, act in a, in a manner that's uh, trustworthy, okay? Uh, so here, a central operator is not needed, but a validator node is selected among the various potential uh, candidate validator nodes. Now, the selection is driven by an algorithm um, via the consensus mechanism. So proof of work is one consensus mechanism, proof of stake is another consensus mechanism. Basically, it's a set of rules that determine who gets to be the validator node. And so uh, once you have um, this kind of setup, what it's saying is because we can have, um, we, we, we can kind of, we cannot readily predict or anticipate who the validator node will be, um, then, uh, you know, there, there's no way to uh, kind of pre-plan or premeditate any kind of fraudulent transaction. Okay, so tamper resistance, again, being the main value proposition of blockchain technology, really requires that we have a decentralization of decision-making power, so the validation power. So if, if, uh, if we don't know who's going, which node is going to be the validator node in the next batch of transactions and then for the next block, then, you know, um, all of the nodes kind of have to uh, assume that everybody's going to act in a truthful manner, okay? So, um, so the decentralization of decision-making power is actually the intended behavior and outcome of the consensus mechanism, okay? 
And this cannot be predicted a priori. You cannot predict because this, the decentralization, the outcome of decentralized, how decentralized decision making or validation authority is actually emerges from the network of nodes, which nodes are on at the time and their interactions, what they're actually doing at, at that point in time. So going back, um, you know, uh, we, we said that, you know, um, algorithms have these real world consequences that are materialized in practice. There are unintended consequences such as, you know, um, like takeover of, of the blockchain and whatnot that could happen, technically could happen. And this is due to the opaque connection between data processes and outcomes, okay? Now, <clears throat> decentralization is actually quite a problem. Although, you know, when, when designing, um, let's say, you know, the Bitcoin network or the blockchain, uh, or other uh, Ethereum blockchain, you know, we wanted to make sure that this kind of setup would lead to a uh, decentralized decision authority. What we actually observe in practice is that it's not that decentralized. Okay, so you know, the um, as a measure of centralization or decentralization, uh, the Gini coefficient um, is a measure of wealth distribution. Um, and, and when we look at the Gini coefficient for different various countries. Um, the USA, um, the Gini coefficient is, was around 0.4, um, maybe a couple of years ago. North Korea was 0.86, and you can imagine how, how centralized wealth is in North Korea. And uh, if you look at the Bitcoin, um, the Gini coefficient for Bitcoin, it's actually um, more concentrated than it is in, in North Korea. So you know, we cannot really presume that there is kind of decentralized uh, decision-making authority, or you know, this is the wealth distribution. But you know, this points to that problem. Uh, one ad um, additional kind of indicator of this problem is that what we see these days are these mining pools. So instead of having these individual autonomous nodes um, you know, um, competing to, to be validated nodes on the blockchain or for, for the Bitcoin network, what we see are these pools where um, you know, they can pull computing power to have a, um, a greater hash rate. And what we see is that you know, we have these major pools that are taking um, you know, a uh, big proportion of the, the validation tasks. So for example, Poolin has, has, this is recently early July, um, Poolin has had 17.7% of the, the uh, validation, F2 pool 17%, so on and so forth. If you look at the origin or the, the location of these uh, mining pools, interestingly, uh, Poolin, F2 pool, btc.com, Ant pool, via BTC, uh, 1T hash and 88 coin, BTC.top. All these are from China. Uh, slush pool is from uh, the Czech Republic and then there are some more minor pools. So what we see is actually um, you know, China uh, has about 81% of the validation um, kind of has about 81%. Now, you know that with uh, proof of work, as long as you can have over 50% of the validation power, you can actually kind of Take control of the of the, the the writing on the block. Okay, and so this this poses um, numerous problems. I'm not saying that they are colluding to do this, but if they were to collude, um, and and you know the pools in China were to create super pools, uh, it would be very easy to um, kind of take take control of the the blockchain network here. Okay, so what we're doing here is. Uh, what I'm what, what what I focus on is um, and and I'm a kind of a computational modeler and and, and I use agent-based modeling and simulation is to to see how we can use uh, agent-based modeling uh, as a tool to think about how to design better systems and so you know because we we have to design systems where the outcomes are non-deterministic um, can we actually before rolling out before implementing and deploying such technologies can we actually study the behavior and, and potential consequences, potential outcomes of such difficult kind of complex systems and use that to better anticipate what problems might arise and how we might be able to use them more properly in an intentional, uh, in, to, to produce intended outcomes. Okay, so what basically what, we're trying, what I'm trying to do is you know, use uh, agent-based modeling as a tool for design theorizing. How do we theorize about um, how to design better um, systems such as, you know, blockchain networks or, or any other kinds of system? Okay, so here in, in, this, in this talk, I'm just going to use the blockchain example and the proof-of-stake consensus mechanism as an example 
to just kind of guide through this thought process. Okay, so what 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 we did in this in this study um, particularly is we created a model of an agent based model of um, proof of stake consensus mechanism. Uh, so basically, we're just implementing a a simulated blockchain network uh, using the proof of stake consensus mechanism. So uh, we have a blockchain <coughs> uh, consist network consisting of some uh, validator nodes, potential validator nodes. Uh, each agent, uh, uh, so A is a parameter for the total number of nodes. Um, and each agent, uh, small a, is assigned an initial currency balance, uh, which is B sub A. Uh, and at each point in time, um, there's a random number of transactions um, of some size, less than what you have, uh, between random pairs of nodes that take place. Okay, so this, this, this is kind of a, um, like a simplified assumption where we're just saying you know that there would be transactions and we don't really have uh, at this stage we're, we're just saying that you know we're not going to incorporate any kind of patterns in the transactions okay uh, and that takes place and a node is selected one of the nodes is selected to be the validator and the likelihood of becoming the validator node depends on the proof of stake consensus mechanism and so uh, the likelihood actually depends on uh, the decision making power which is proportional to the budget or the the um, the currency balance of each node uh, at that time. <clears throat> uh, at the end of that, once the validator node is chosen, the validator nodes receive the transaction fee, and and that fee is added to its balance. Okay, so basically, you know, it's just a simple vanilla proof of stake consensus mechanism that has been that that we're just trying to recreate into like a um, like an agent based model. Okay, now you know these parameters a so, you know small a b sub a all these. Uh, we can manipulate to create different use cases, different scenarios of blockchain use. So for example, you know, the, a blockchain operator could decide, you know, I, I want to create a, a blockchain for, let's say, small, small, um, uh, small transactions, like petty cash transactions. Or I could be, you know, thinking about um, uh, creating a blockchain for, um, for processing transactions or doing cryptocurrency transactions for large Settlements in, in, in cash, so interbank institutional transactions, and so here, you know, it would determine, for example, if it's if it's this kind of um, uh, a global network of small, a lot of nodes uh, trying to to kind of interact and, and do small cash transactions versus fewer but larger, larger, you know, fewer nodes but with lots of balance, and they're doing into you know large scale inter inter institution. Uh, transfers that would create different use cases, and so we could we can kind of depending on these scenarios, we can see whether or not uh, would the proof of stake mechanism work well in producing um, decentralized decision authority in this kind of network, in a in a petty cash kind of transaction network, or you know in in large uh, in institutional transfer kind of networks. Okay. Um, the the outcome of interest was decentralization or the degree of decentralization. Uh, and this is, uh, and we're gonna, uh, we, we use the Gini coefficient as explained before to, to measure the decentralization of decision authority, okay? So the Gini coefficient basically is a measure of, um, was developed in economics as a measure of income inequality. Uh, and so um, based on this graph, it is the, um, the area of A uh, determined by the Lorentz curve um, divided by um, the, the sum of areas A and B. So when you have a genie of zero, okay, um, what that means is um, uh, A is the line of equality. So the Lorentz curve becomes a line of equality, and so A, the area of A is zero, A plus B is B, so zero over B would be zero, and that is no inequality, it's fully decentralized. So every node has the same likelihood, same uniform likelihood of becoming the validator node. When you have genie of one, what that means is B is uh, zero, well B is, is a null, null uh, there's no area B, and so A over A plus B would be one. That means is one node has full, um, full authority, always, one node always has the decision-making authority, and that only one node always has it, okay? So that means fully centralized, okay? So uh, depending on the measure of uh, the Gini coefficient, uh, if it's close to one, that means it's more centralized. If it's close to zero, or if it's lower, then it's more central, more decentralized. Okay. Now, so we uh, we replicated, <coughs> we replicated. So we took a um, because at the time when we started the study, we didn't really have um, 
Uh, uh, so Ethereum hadn't implemented um, proof of stake yet. Uh, and so we, we took, we used NXT's, um, it's another blockchain, NXT's data, um, all of the NXT's blockchain to kind of recreate, um, to, to parameterize our agent-based model to see whether or not we could kind of quasi recreate what happened with NXT. So basically what we did is we took the parameters of NXT at its inception, the number of nodes, the stake distribution, you know, which node has how much um, um, NXTs, and uh, the average number of transactions, the average volume of transactions, all these parameters into um, our agent-based model and try to simulate uh, the, the behaviors to see whether or not we could reproduce um, what we actually observe in practice with the NXT. Okay, so when we validate, so when we simulated the model uh, and checked the, um, the Gini coefficient across the two, the actual and the simulated, we see, although there's some deviation in the beginning, we see very close uh, results um, from our simulation validation. So given NXT's initial state when it first started and no re recalibration of the parameters afterwards, what we see is, you know, the, the Gini coefficient started off at around 0 0.834 and then, you know, shot up to about 0 0.96. Uh, and, and, and the simulated um, results are very close to the actual NXT results. Uh, when we actually look at, you know, um, more closely at the, the validation, uh, we, 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 when we check the percentage of simulated Gini within 5% of actual NXT observed Gini, uh, we see that it's it's after about 20,000, 20, 25, 30,000 blocks becomes actually very close. Uh, so over 90% um, of the simulated Gini would be um, within the 5% of the actual NXT observed Gini. So with that in, in, in mind, with that confidence that our model actually can reproduce the behaviors of an actual blockchain network, we you know went in to design some experiments to kind of stress test, if you will, uh, stress tests the operation of the you know the, the emergent outcomes of decentralization for different kinds of um, scenarios, as I explained earlier. Okay, so uh, the parameters that we manipulate are basically the parameters, the design parameters of the blockchain, as well as behavioral parameters. Okay, so the design parameters we have three design parameters, um, which is you know the initial stake distribution. So you know when when you start. Uh, you have X number of nodes in the beginning. And so uh, NXT had 73 nodes to begin with. So A0 is 73. And they each started with different kind of levels of, of, of wealth in their, in their wallets, okay? Or NXT cryptocurrencies in their wallets, okay? Uh, and so we basically took that as a given. Uh, and um, we, we actually experiment with different kinds of um, stake distribution. So uh, I don't really recall what the NXT actual look like, but we can kind of look at different uh, initial states of, you know, if the nodes were, uh, the states were distributed as normal, as beta distributed, as power law, where um, there's more rich and, and fewer poor, or power law, the invert, the other power law, where there's very few poor, but a lot of rich. Um, a a U-shaped distribution, there's a lot of poor, a lot of rich, but nobody in the middle. The kind of skewed distribution where, uh, there's um, more on the low side, few on the high side, high, high wealth side. And so we can experiment with different initial stake distributions. Uh, and um, for the other parameters, um, we, we, we took the NXT baseline and we created, uh, because these are numeric um, parameters, we created a 5, 10, 25, 50, 250, 500, and 1,000% of the NXT actuals to create this um, um, to create different levels. So if you take, you know, 5% of 73, I think that's like four. Um, so you know, initial validator nodes, what if we started with four nodes to begin with, okay? Or 10% would be about seven, um, you know, 7.3. So if we started with seven nodes to begin with, 50% would be, you know, 36. Uh, if we started with 36 or 1,000%, what if we started with 730 nodes to begin with, uh, what would happen to the, um, to the overall outcomes of uh, blockchain decentralization or, or decision authority decentralization. We did the same for all the parameters. So transaction fee, the NXT baseline is 207. We took 5, 10, 25, 50, 250, 500, 1,000% of these values. Uh, the transaction amount is um, um, the, the kind of 
uh, for each transaction, the average transaction is 39,434 uh, NXTs were you know, sent back and forth on average. Uh, transaction volume is the number of transactions in the beginning. Um, so so 2.54 uh, transactions. Uh, and then um, the validator network growth uh, is how, how quickly the, the network grew over time, the validator network. Okay, and so we can we can have a slower, fast-growing network with a lot more validated nodes joining the blockchain network, or we could have very slow um, uh, network growth where you know uh, the number of nodes is growing at a very slow rate. And so we, we can manipulate, we can um, set, you know, simulate various different scenarios by um, setting the parameters at different levels. Okay, so if we look at the um, the simulation results, these are um, basically Keeping everything else equal, what if we manipulated one parameter? And obviously, uh, we can also do interaction effects and, and you know, manipulate multiple parameters at a time. But just to get a base understanding, um, <clears throat> we simulated the, the main effects first. Okay, here the thick line is the NXT, and the other um, various lines are the, uh, uh, the different uh, initial state distributions. So what we see here is that uh, when you start off with a skewed distribution, you're going to get very hygienic, very centralized decision authority. Okay, so a handful, very few nodes will actually uh, always be the validated nodes, which is bad, okay, in terms of tamper resistance. Um, when we have, um, uh, which ones are these? Uh, for most of the others, so power law, normal, uh, all these, um, typically, except for the skewed distribution, um, typically, the uniform distribution uh, would lead to the lowest or slightly lower GNI than the actual observed GNI. Okay? Uh, when we look at the initial validator node, um, the number of valid initial validator nodes, uh, when we have, um, what is this? When we have, uh, <clears throat> when we start with a large network, then it's much more decentralized. When we start with a small network, then it's a bit more centralized than what we have. Okay, so. Uh, it's probably better if you want if you want to ensure uh, more decentralization of decision authority. It's probably better to start with a much larger network. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Transaction fee amount didn't really have that big of an impact. Um, the actual when we look at transaction amount, um, bigger transactions, larger transactions actually had um, a much more a, a better decentralized outcomes. Um, when we look at transaction volumes. Uh, again, here, um, more frequent transactions actually had uh, better outcomes. And interestingly, when we look at validated network growth, uh, what we observe is that, uh, what do we observe? Oh, it's a kind of an inverted U shape where uh, either have very small, uh, uh, very um, slow growth. Um, actually, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Slow growth actually creates much better, uh, much uh, more more decentralized, um, more decentralized decision authority distributions. Okay, so basically, you know, we, we did this this kind of simulation uh, experiments to to figure out you know what would what the impacts would be on kind of the operation of the blockchain. Now, uh, these are just you know illustrative results. If we get into more um, kind of rigorous statistical validation of these results, we run. Um, used a, a um, regression model to to look at um, whether or not these parameters actually have um, a statistically significant impact on the um, the Gini coefficient. And uh, a lot of the the results that we observed earlier in in the visual representations actually have a um, a measurable and statistically significant impact. Okay, um, so you know as a summary, um, like it, it's kind of an initial. Um, set of propositions about you know, how should we design uh, or how should we implement, deploy um, uh, the proof of stake blockchains uh, and what kind of impact should, can we anticipate given our kind of agent-based model analysis. So uh, the initial stake distribution really not, no impact uh, except when skewed and that's really bad uh, for initial network size, larger initial networks produces more decentralized. Uh, smaller transaction fees has a marginal impact on, on decentralization. Um, for transaction amount, large average transaction amounts are likely better. Um, and for decentralization, transaction volume, larger transaction volumes are also likely better. And very slow or very fast growth rates 
Um, so I, I, yeah, so there was an inverted U shape. Very slow, very fast growth rates actually lead to um, a more decentralized networks. Now, what's um, really interesting, or, or, or what I feel was interesting about this um, set of analysis, is that we can actually do some kind of scenario test. Given these main effect results, we can kind of look at, okay, if we were to put all of the factors, all the parameters that produce more decentralized networks um, together, okay, and so larger transaction uh, volume, larger transaction amount, uh, small transaction fees, uh, either slow or, or um, um, fast uh, network growth, all these things together, what, you know, how much decentralization, maximal decentralization can we, can we uh, anticipate? So what we did is we, we put, um, if we were to only um, look at the design parameters, which is the initial stake distribution, the, when do we start the networks, so the, the initial um, size of the validator node network, uh, and the transaction fee, so that's the, what the blockchain operator can, can predetermine. Uh, and uh, when we also add in the behavioral parameters, so you know, this is a use case. This is, you know, are we looking at lots of small case, uh, transactions, small transactions, or are we looking at you know, a few large transactions? And so that depends on where the blockchain, uh, where the, the blockchain network can be used, for what purpose it is used. And so if we use the design parameters only, uh, it does produce, a much better decentralized scenario than the actual NXT. Okay, uh, when we put in also when we also consider um, the behavioral parameters, and so um, including the behavioral and the design parameters, then we actually produce much much lower uh, or lower centralization or better decentralization outcomes in the blockchain, at least in a in a simulated uh, environment. Okay, so what this means is careful choice about you know, how, where and how we implement. So how do we set up the network, transaction fees? When do we start the network? You know, do we have to uh, make sure that we have a, a critical mass of initial validator nodes? Or do we start small with a few nodes, so on and so forth? And uh, determining, deciding, uh, given my, my purpose of implementing or the use case for implementing this blockchain network, you know, large transactions, small transactions, um, all these kinds of things, we can actually anticipate um, what the, the how much tamper resistance or decentralization can we produce, and that leads to greater trust in the tra transfer resistance of the blockchain. Okay, so um, I'm uh, running out of time. Uh, I'm just going to quickly um, summarize um, the conclusions. Um, so what what we're I'm trying to do here is um, we we're basically questioning um, that or. or you know, the, the problem that we're trying to tackle is that well-intentioned designs of algorithmic governance systems may lead to unexpected and undesirable outcomes, okay? And, um, and, and so it, despite the well, best intentioned intentions of designers, uh, especially for algorithm-driven kinds of systems, we really don't know, um, it's very difficult to anticipate how it will be used. Because you know, it's not just about implementing technical requirements. A lot of times the technical requirements don't translate immediately into the actual use case um, intentions of the, the, the requirements, okay? Um, so, you know, um, uh, one thing more, more immediately, we, we propose um, some design theory, or at least guidelines about uh, proof of state consensus mechanism um, designed for, for blockchain networks. We identify the parameters, that are likely or have an impact on um, decentralized, decentralization levels and what might lead to desirable or undesirable levels of decentralization. We also identify the behavioral parameters that are likely to lead to desirable or undesirable levels of decentralization. And another thing is that you know, um, we're proposing that um, agent-based modeling and simulation can be a very useful tool for this kind of design theorizing um, for, building design theories for algorithm mediated decision making kind of system okay now obviously um, there are uh, limitations you know um, one, one thing that we haven't kind of discussed yet is you know what, what is an acceptable or critical level of decentralization you know what, what's a threshold for when we can safely say okay with that, at this level of decentralization tamper resistance is is kind of guaranteed. So what is a guaranteed level of decentralization? We don't really know. We, we know that we can reduce it somewhat, but 80 genie of 0.8 could actually be quite high or too high. 
what could be an acceptable level? That part, you know, uh, uh, we need to study that a bit more. Um, again, we only looked at the main effects, but there, you know, there's so many parameters that looking at the interaction effect takes a lot of uh, more more experimentation. Um, you know, obviously we can we can study other consensus mechanism, you know, different variations of of proof of stake. Obviously, we can do proof of work, proof of uh, uh, POA. So on and so forth. Uh, the major thing here is that we need also can and should probably endogenize the behaviors and parameters. And so um, what, what, what we observe is there's a lot of strategic kind of manipulation. You know, people transact not just randomly, you know, I don't randomly send you cryptocurrency or randomly do some kind of transaction, but there is some intent behind it. So is it for, you know, wealth uh, accumulation? Is it for you know, transaction transfer? Is there any kind of so if we have a merchant there's more likely inflow of funds you know rather than outflow of funds so we need to have a better model of these patterns of behaviors uh, and, and see whether or not those would have an impact also on kind of the, the design propositions that, that uh, we have uh, outlined here so um so i'm gonna end it here um almost 40 minutes uh i hope it was interesting um, basically, you know, what we're trying to do is, um, you know, we, we understand how to, well, I think we think we know how to understand, uh, we think we know how to design systems, um, but the actual use of the system really depends on how it's used. And especially for algorithm driven, um, like information systems, uh, because it is difficult to anticipate and it clearly uh, a, lot of, a lot of times frequently there are many unintended outcomes that come out of these um, that come out of the uh, operations of these systems we, uh, we do need better um, tools methods approaches to anticipate to better understand the design implications um, of these kinds of you know, these kinds of systems so I'll end it at that and um, I will uh, see you at the live Q&A session and I hope you have a great Computing Research Week. Thank you so much. Otherwise, stop.